when I saw Jimmy, he was sitting in for the raves. Later, they became his backup band. And for a while, he called them Jimmy James and the Blue Flames. Jimmy James and the, and the Blue Flames. But he was okay. also jamming around with Curtis Knight at the time, too. Yeah. And then there was also Lonnie Youngblood. Yeah. The saxophone player. I mean, he... He played with just about everybody. Wilson Pickett, the Isley Brothers, Little Richard. Little Richard, yeah. I mean, just... Uh, he showed everybody up. They had to throw him out. Yeah, yep. That's what happened with Little Richard. Uh, For sure. Oh, sure. You, you know, when when he... Uh, when, when he did his first performance over in... I guess it was probably London. And, you know, this is... Albert Hall. Yeah, uh, maybe even prior to that. I don't know. Clapton was there to see him. Uh, Paul McCartney, uh, Peter Townsend. They all thought their careers were over. Yeah, I mean, Clapton, Clapton said to Peter Townsend after the show, he said, what are you going to do now, Pete? <laughs> he also told him that Jimmy had stolen some of Peter Townsend's moves, yeah. you know, licks and that windmill. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, boy, speaking of Pete Townsend, that that dude could really jump high. Yeah, you know? <laughs> he's tall. He's got long legs. Yeah, maybe it just looked like he was jumping. I, 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 I saw them on the Who's Next tour in the summer of '70. Hey, everybody, welcome back. This is. Uh, some more time spent with the old rock and roller over there, Forrest McDonald. I'm Blackjack from WRFG in Atlanta. It's a community radio station. And the key here is we play over 20 hour blues every week, Monday through Friday from 6 to 10 a.m. Eastern time. We've got a blue show on Sunday mornings called Route 66 or Route 66, depending on the way you pronounce it. And that goes from 7 to 9 Eastern Time. We've got uh, a show on Sunday afternoons with music from Louisiana, Zydeco, Cajun, Creole, all kinds of great stuff. It's a multi-ethnic, diverse radio station, and the music reflects the people who are involved, and we're all volunteers. Forrest and I met over 20 years ago when... Uh, my hair certainly wasn't this color. Yours stayed the same, although I have less of it now than, <laughs> than we used to. Well, what we're doing here is picking apart Forrest's musical history and journeys and experiences and trying to break them down into digestible segments because we could, we could go on forever. And Forrest is doing the editing and putting these up on his YouTube channel. So it's a good place to land and catch up on uh, eh, just some interesting personal stories. Forrest, you're a songwriter. And you've been doing it for, what, 50, 60 years? You know, Doug, <laughs> in the summer of 1970, right. I said to myself, no matter how good of a guitar player I ever get to be, I'll just be a guitar player. I'll be very easily replaceable and dispensable. I said, but if I write my own songs, then I've tripled my value at least. And so I pursued on a direction of songwriting. Now, here's a funny thing. I don't. Everybody has their own way of, of doing it. But at first, when I started writing songs, I thought they all had to be true. And so sometimes you either run out of truth or too much truth is spilling the beans and it's not a good thing. Uh, and then, then I finally realized, oh, you can put in metaphors. You can put in something that happened in your life 10 years ago five years ago in the future you can use somebody else's life and their story and you can bring all of these elements together but the primary for me the primary gift that an artist gives to the people 
is they reflect and they represent the feeling and the mood and the tide, if you will, of the nation and the world as it exists at any given point in time. Uh, so it, it's a chance to reflect, but be very creative about it. For instance, Paul McCartney, when he wrote Blackbird, mm. he wrote that about the Arkans, about the civil rights movement. Yeah. Uh, and but little he, did we know back then. No, yeah. we had no idea. No. Uh, so when I wrote the the album Colorblind, and on the liner notes I said, oh, "Warning: boy. These lyrics could be thought provoking," <laughs> um, uh, because. Uh, it, you know, some songs will just come to you. You're driving in your your car, and you go, "Wow, that's a verse!" And you you quickly grab your right now. Oh, good! So I'm at the light. Okay, it changed. And then you you're going along, and you're thinking about it. And then next light, got the next verse. And it, sometimes you're very lucky, and in five minutes you've written a song. But in other cases, for instance, Blue Morning Sun that I wrote about my brother Steve's passing on the Blues in a Bucket CD. You were in Memphis when that happened, weren't I you? Was, I was in Memphis when that happened. And the story happened to me. And I told the story as it was happening to me. My sister called. She gave me the worst news. You know, this kind of stuff. But the chorus... It's a blue morning sun. I wrote 40 years ago, but but had no place to go with it. So I just kept it. And there was one line in there, I'm too blue to travel because the sky is so gray. And there was a, a coffee shop I used to stop at and you could order blueberry muffins. And the lady would always yell, too blue to travel. And then fry them up on the grill and then slide them down and drop them in the bag. And but but for the song, it was like, wow. Uh, it it all just came together. It's a blue morning sun that greets me today. My brother's gone, he's passed away. Now I'm too blue to travel because the sky is so gray. Um uh, and and that was it. Uh, that was the hook on the chorus. Uh, so sometimes it, it takes a long time. In that case, it took, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. But something like riding on the blues train that I wrote for... By the way, that yeah. song opens my show every Tuesday morning on the radio. And it has for close to 20 some years. And, and I'm and I'm still getting that $12.50 check a week. <laughs> I thank you for that. Um, so anyways, back to the song. Yeah, right? so um, so it, on that song, I was thinking about Ra Raymond Victor and thinking about how unpredictable he is and how spontaneous, how it was like, you can't harness lightning. You can't oh. ride the wind. I was singing about Ray right there. Wow. Um, uh, and then I said, well, the blues is a story I never want to end. And when I play my guitar every night and day, there's not a better feeling. It's the passion that I crave. And then we're riding on the blues train, rolling down the track. Right. Which, by the way, folks, that's the uh, informal name of my show. The strip programming is Good Morning Blues. My segment on Tuesday mornings is riding the blues train. And on that song, and I I use the newer version now where Becky Wright does mm -hmm. the all aboard intro. Yeah. You've got uh Raymond Victor on there, Andrew Black, yeah, John McKnight, Schwanky. John, John Schwanky. Yeah. That's, that was your rhythm section. Mm -hmm. Uh who else was on that? Uh, just just me. I did all the guitars. Of course. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Tony Carey played a little bit of keyboard on there. Okay. All right. 
and the interchange of the vocals is just uh, magic you know and those and those lyrics who would have thought you were talking about raymond victor there you know? right I, i've never told probably anyone that so you're the first to hear it and soon the millions will be now now i'm going to be thinking you know because i always listen to my show you know yeah, yeah listen to every song all the way through as i put it together i'm never going to think about that song you know the the same way yeah. you know so what i'm hearing is you don't have a set formula or pattern for writing songs it's it, it happens whatever inspires you at that moment it, precisely let me give you one more story sure um when um my second wife, uh, Debbie, told me she wanted a divorce, and she moved out. And I walked out to my back porch, and there was dirt. You know, it's dirty uh, before the grass starts. And I just bent over, and I was thinking about everything. And I started to cry. And the ground was dusty, parched, and bare. First came a stream. That was my first tear. And then I kept crying and I made a little puddle. And now there's a river there. And after all these years, all I've got to show is a river, a river of tears. Yeah. So, so you know, so, sometimes it happens like that, too. Um, you know, this is a this is a question that I've asked a lot of musicians over the years you know about their creative process when it comes to songwriting and it really varies like you were saying a little bit earlier you've got some lyrics that you pulled out from the library if you will from the archives from yeah. years ago mm -hmm. that makes sense and finally found a place for them to to fit you know right. tinsley ellis does the same thing he's got hundreds and hundreds of of songs that he does and a lot of musicians these days use their their smartphone, you know, uh -huh. to record lyrics. Yeah. And some of these songs, you know, he pulls out years later or pieces of them. And some of them, like you, written right on the spot, something inspirational happens. He he lost his son uh, a couple of years ago and he wrote some music as a result uh -huh. that was just heart wrenching. Yeah, and uh, it's never been published. It's never been released on a big name label. I have some copies of it, and that amazing what what the human experience can trigger at, sure. at, at sure. times. Sure, Keith Richards woke up in the middle of the night because he was dreaming of the lick for satisfaction. You know, and so I uh, okay. Now, <laughs> now hold on right here. Okay, <laughs> I I read Keith Richards' book, and yeah. and I and I read that story, and he asked a couple of guys around the house, "Have you ever heard this lick? No. Have you ever heard this lick? No. Well, I guess I wrote it then. <laughs> uh, okay, so one night. And about 1969 or 70, I was listening to a very far away blues station. And I hear this blues song and the saxophone played. It was a saxophone riff. And I thought, that's where he got that lick. Uh, and, and then, like, but I could never get the name of the song in years Later, I heard it again, and I still couldn't get the lick. But when I read Keith's book, and he said, well, I guess I wrote it. If anybody knows any different, let me know. <laughs> Keith, I got a few words for you, buddy. Maybe maybe he should hire, and I'm not real good with popular music and who's out there on the top 40 charts these days, but maybe he should hire Ed Sheeran's lawyer. Isn't that the young guy that was just going to court because someone thought he had glommed on to a four chord process four chord procession from um oh you know that guy <laughs> I, I can't Marvin Gaye 
Marvin Gaye. Gaye. Okay. Yeah. Thought thought he glommed on to uh, some of Marvin Gaye's music, and they, they you know the the court proceedings they they came up with you know a couple dozen songs that use that same chord progression. Yeah. And I and I turned to AJ and I said, you know, after all these years have gone by, and all the songs and the music that has been created, how how do you come up with something that's never been done before? Mm -hmm. how, how can you be sure yeah. that it's never been done before? Right. I, um, I've always heard that the best writing comes from personal experience. Writing has been a cornerstone of my career, my day job, some of it creative, you know, some of it not so creative, but it got me through and, you know, 30 some years of, being involved with uh, that process has served me well. But there are other ways to get that good writing. Otis Taylor, I was hanging out with him at the Blues Music Awards many years ago. He had just come into his own again and uh, had had won, I think it might have still been called the W.C. Handy Awards. Back. Yeah, I recall I was there. Yeah, and I said... Uh, where do you get the ideas for your songs? Because there's they're like historical narratives in that. And his honest answer was, I just pick up the newspaper. All the stories are in the paper. Mm. That's where I get my inspirations. Interesting. And then you and I think back to the 60s, what the music meant to us. Yeah. You know, Buffalo Springfield, for what it's worth. Uh -huh. for instance. Incredible. Yeah. Country Joe and the and the fish, you know, uh -huh. and the, I I I feel the same thing happening today. You know, the world seems to be in such a turmoil, and again, my focus is on the blues music arena, right. the blues the blues music world. There's more and more music being produced, recorded, distributed, and heard that talks about contemporary times, like. Do you Shamika Copeland, for instance, uh -huh. you know, yeah. done, done Come Too Far. That's her newest album. Yeah. There are songs on there that I, there's, there's one called The Talk. And it's about an African-American mother worried about her son. And she knows he's come of age where she's got to have the talk with him. I had a grandmother contact me after I played that song on the air wanting to know who it was, how to get a copy of it. And I said, why? She says, I want to play it for my grandson. I want to give it to him. Music moves people. Yeah. You know that. Yeah, yeah. You know my song, I wasn't looking for trouble, but trouble found me. And yeah. every word of that is true, you know. Uh, I, I went to play some music with some friends of mine. I got there a little early, about a quarter to nine. That's when this car pulled up and blocked me in. That's about the time, my friends, that the trouble began. Yeah. I wasn't looking for trouble, but trouble found me. And I'll be doing unto others as they'll be doing unto me, as they'll be <laughs> doing unto me. You know. Was that was that when you pulled out your black belt techniques? Well, I, 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 me and Shranky and Lawrence Perlman were going to record some of uh, the Voodoo Screamer songs. And we got at the gas station, the meeting place early. So I went over to Kroger to buy some sandwiches and uh, five or six um, African-American people blocked my car, but blocked this 19 year old pretty uh, girl that they were abducting. Uh, and I had to fight six of them to save her life. And I got really beat up, but I saved her. And so when I, I got back to with the sandwiches to where Schwanky and McKnight were, and I'm covered in blood and my shirt's ripped off and everything. They said, what happened? Let's get them. You know, I said, it's too late for that now. We got we to gotta go record. So after four and a half hours of recording, I had the worst headache when I got home and Debbie opened the door and I was there just like covered in blood and clothes ripped apart. But... I wrote a fabulous song on the Colorblind album. I mean, I nailed it completely. So, yeah. 
Yeah. Ringo Starr, peace and love, peace and love. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, um, how many guitars do you have now? That's a rough question. Because I just, I, I just sold my Flying V out of desperation. And I had that guitar for a long time. I love that guitar. Is it is it harder to play than other? The, the Flying V, no, it was easy to play. Yeah. Um, it, it had a really good neck for me. It was light. It was fiberglass, actually. Oh. Um, and, and it had that really good, authentic Gibson tone. Um, but right now, I have... Uh, the Ernie Ball Music Man, um, designed by Eddie Van Halen. I use that a lot on the Finger Licking Blues album. I've got one of my, my favorites. Yeah, is it really? Yeah. I, I've got my old uh, Strat, like Blackie, like Clapton. Um, and I play my Gibson 335 a lot, the black one, uh, like B.B. King. Mm -hmm. And then my my Blue Zion Radicaster is just an awesome guitar. I've had that since 85 or 80, somewhere around there. So those four are probably the the main arsenal of electric. I, and I've got a bass guitar. Um, acoustics, I've got a Martin D35. Wow. I, I've had forever. Uh, Dan Jellicoe, uh classical. Um a baby Taylor, um, a, a Giannini, a uh, 12 string. Uh, Kalen's got an old Gibson acoustic, really nice. Um, and I have, um, uh, what was that guy named? Koffenheimer or something. Uh, a really, really old guitar that a friend of mine's sister it belonged to her brother. He died, and she wanted it in the hands of a good guitar player to stay in a good guitar family. So it's got fabulous tone. The intonation isn't that great. So I keep it on the wall most of the time. Um, so I'm probably working with about 11. Did you ever think you would have that many when you formed the Oxbow incidents way back in the 1960s? No, in fact, yeah, my first guitar was a Kent guitar. It was a Japanese guitar. I think it cost $87. I talked my mom into getting it to me for Christmas of 1964. And then a kid down the street, Gary Aldrich, he had a three pickup. Wait, no, no not yet. I traded the Kent and I bought a Fender Mustang like Johnny Winter had. Uh, and a little uh, Fender Champ amp. I thought I was going to take over the world. Uh, <laughs> you know, London by fire, the East Coast by storm. We had the gear now, you know, we got real gear. Uh, and then I traded it for a Hagstrom and then for a Gibson 335T and then for a, a 1959 Gibson Fretless Wonder. It would sell for about four hundred thousand dollars. I a sold Fretless Wonder. Never heard of it. There, it's the three pickup black one. Um, John Sykes from Blue Murder used one on uh, there on one of the White Snake albums. Um, uh, uh, and then I then I started playing uh, a melody maker. I I played a Les Paul Junior like Leslie West. Leslie West. Yeah, that was a fabulous guitar. A 55 Strat I played for a long time. I got the Firebird that Dwayne Allman played. Um, and then I got a Gibson SG like Santana played for a long time. Um, and then, gosh, I I got the, I bought the Gibson Les Paul special from my friend Peter Glindeman on the West Coast that got stolen just after the old time rock and roll session um that ha and i remember the day because it was the day that the week that elvis died and so i left the uh, memphis station to fly back to la i saw a guy put it on the baggage claim went under the thing 
and somebody in the back said, this ain't going nowhere. And he took it off. and That's the last time I saw that guitar. So I, I got the, the Fender, the 72, and I played it for a long, long time. And then I finally got the, the V. Played that for a long, long time. So out of all of those guitars, is there one that stands out that is the ultimate? The 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 Stratocaster fits my hand like a glove. And if I was ever an old man with crippling arthritis and I had to play one guitar only, it would probably be the Strat. <laughs> um, but if I wanted to be... Uh, on the big boy stage, I'd play the 335, the Gibson, the big black one. Uh, and if I wanted to be on the rock stage or anywhere between, I'd play the Zion or, or the Music Man. And they have different voices, don't they? They have different voices and, and completely different feels and and tonalities and such. So they they're they're even though you can with the right pedals and so on and so forth, you can make a you can make a Fender sound like a Gibson and kind of vice versa if it's set up right. Um, you know, one of the um, one of the guitars that I always recognize, and maybe it's because of all the country music that I listen to, which is really blues, the classic stuff, is a Telecaster. That's got a unique voice to it. Oh, right? Telecaster, especially with country. You you couldn't be in a country band if you didn't have a Telecaster back in the day. Yeah, and uh, Roy Buchanan used to play one. Roy Buchanan. May, the, yeah, and then Albert Collins, master of the Telecaster. Yeah. And he played with a capo tuned to F sharp minor. Uh, yeah. Waylon Jennings. Yeah, yeah. He, he had a beautiful Telecaster. And his son is a great uh, musician, too. Shooter. Yeah, and we saw the whole band um, together as a family, and they were really good, and he was impressive. Yeah, I, I, I've got some of his music. It was, uh, there's a, a song, um, I think, Put the O Back in Country Music. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, who? <laughs> Who who took the O out and George Jones does an intro on on that one, and uh, there's a, there's also a song on this album uh, called Southern Comfort, and it it it's one of those hair raising you know the back of your neck the nape of your neck the hairs will stand up. Uh -huh. It's got that old time gospel sound, and he sings with his mother. She's she's one of the uh, backup singers, you know the harmonies. Uh, Jesse Coulter you know, is out there. Jesse yeah. Coulter, great. Yeah, yeah. I got to meet them. In fact, Jesse got Waylon to autograph the Honky Tonk Heroes album for me. And he wrote his name right over Billy Shaver's face on the front of that album. Uh huh. And those two used to go at it all the time. And when I had a chance to introduce him from the stage, he says, look at that some bitch wrote his name right over my. I'm gonna write. I'm putting my name right over his face. You know, oh, that's yeah. pretty funny. The rivalry never ended. Uh, my, uh, so my, it's uh, just to kind of tag on to something like that. Uh, my old singer for the Wadsworth Mansion, Steve Jablecki, his two favorites were Elvis and Waylon Jennings. So he got a picture of Elvis from the fan club, you know, to Steve. And uh, Waylon came to the local radio station and was going to sign some autographs. So Steve said, will you sign mine? And he, he handed him the backside of the Elvis picture. And he, yeah. you know, he wrote, and Steve Elvis, he says, that's great. You're number two. Elvis is number one. And he's like, <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, a little bit of rivalry there. Uh, real quick on the Bonnie Bramlett thing, I forgot to mention a while ago when the average white band first came to L.A., they were at a party. They didn't really have a name for the group. And Bonnie heard them and listened to them and looked at them and said, how about the average white band? And they kept it. 
you know, she was one of the best interviews, you know, we call them phoners when they phone into the show mm -hmm. that I've ever done. She had so much energy and she was coming to Atlanta to do a benefit for, I think it was breast cancer awareness and just tremendous. Uh, and boy, what, what a musical history. I mean, the people that, that she's been able to perform with and her daughter, Becca is an yeah. in-demand vocalist. Mm -hmm. and has recorded and performed live with just about every major band i mean from fleetwood mac to the rolling stones i think she's just phenomenal um it's it's like a genetic thing i i guess uh -huh. I, don't, I don't know when when you're on stage playing and we had talked earlier in one of the other segments about being up in front of two hundred thousand people uh the riverwalk festival i think Mm -hmm. um the language that you have with other musicians that are at your caliber mm -hmm. how does that happen what how does that esp that mind meld that that unspoken language hitting the note um is that something musicians consciously work on does it just happen is it deeper than that? Is it something primordial that's been there since the dawn of time? Here's how it works. You hone your craft for decades. And you find a crew that you hone it with. And over time and over years, weeks, months, decades, you know everybody's musical vocabulary. I know every word you're going to say. I know every way you can say it. I know every emotional projection you can put behind it so that when everybody is at that level, you get up and you start playing. You don't have to rehearse or anything. You just listen and you're having a conversation through the music because it, uh, whoever starts, ba -dee -ba -dee -ba -boo -doo -da, you know, then the next guy goes, oh, well, I know he just asked me, will I pick him up a slice of pizza? And so I'm going to answer, you know, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and the conversation goes. Um, so you're able to, to push it and push it and know that, okay, in order to get Raymond like to the top of this mountain, we've got to lay this kind of a foundation and build it and build it and build it and just keep hammering this vibe to get him up here, you know? So it, it's just something that you know because you've done it so many times. Um, as a All right. So how did Jimi Hendrix redefine that approach to music? Uh, well, basically, he, he played everything himself on the records for the most part. Uh, be, because uh, uh, Noel Redding couldn't keep up with him. You know, he'd, he'd redo many of Noel's parts um, and, and he'd teach them a lot as well. Mitch Mitchell was essentially a jazz drummer who knew that he just had to keep it going because a lot of improv relies on the drums just keeping the noise going, keeping the vibe going, keeping the feel going. And as long as it keeps going, then the guitar player can take it anywhere. And it, then and the bass player's just got a thump, 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 thump to give a, to, to keep the, the foundation there. So then it, it allows the guitar player to stretch his imagination to the infinite and play fast and then bring it down and play it all slow and lead everybody on a magical journey. That's what Hendrix did. He was able to do that because he did, was so good. Do you ever have a personal experience with Jimmy? Well, so my first wife, 
uh, her, was a Playboy bunny at the New York Club. And her roommate was another Playboy bunny, Devin Wilson, who was Jimi Hendrix's girlfriend when he was filming Are You Experienced? Jimmy used to come over late at night when he'd get off. Then uh, Devin and Terry shared the same bed because it was a you know a New York City rent expensive. Uh, so she'd go out on the couch, and Jimmy had this long brown poncho that I think was photographed wearing during on the uh, Electric Ladyland album cover. One of them. At any rate, he laid it over her and said, you keep this from me. And when she and I got together, she gave it to me from Jimmy. So that's the closest personal experience <laughs> I have with him. <laughs> do, you, do you still have that poncho? When I moved from Boston back to Muscle Shoals, in 1982, my moving van was hijacked in Harnett County, North Carolina, and everything was taken, including Jimmy's poncho. So it's probably at some flea market somewhere where nobody has any idea the value of what it is. Maybe when I was uh, when I was doing one of the Back Porch Blues Festival fundraisers for WRFG. One of my listeners and good friends, we became friends through the radio show. He was an avid fan. His brother had uh, a sash that he got at a Hendrix concert from Jimmy when he threw it out in the audience. And he and he gave it to his brother, my friend, for safekeeping. I got to wear it that 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 night. The problem with the whole thing was there's no provenance like there are no photographs of jimmy wearing this you just word them out right no certificate of authenticity yeah. no forrest thank you very much i appreciate the insights and the conversation and uh safe journeys my friend we better wrap this one up i appreciate it brother i'll see you down the musical story highway on the next adventure the next music moment of the old time rock and roller. So long, yeah. my friends. See ya.